So this afternoon, we're going to talk to you about what we've been working on for the last two years. Um, we were having a good conversation with the KFPS uh, a little over three years ago about what to do with some of our rescue and research funds, the funds that we have set up to do rescue of Frisian horses and then also to conduct research. And uh, we were suggested to do megaesophagus followed by aortic rupture. So um, we started this partnership with the University of Kentucky, who's the Frisian Horse Association of North America's official lab there in the United States. So they do all of our DNA parentage verification already. So there's a good working relationship with that lab. And then, of course, Wagoning University, who we just heard from, Dr. Duckrow and his team, uh, they came on board and they've done all of our DNA extraction uh, for samples taken here in the Netherlands. And then, of course, again, we have a great partnership with the KFPS and we've uh, enjoyed our conversations with them as we work through this research, letting them know where we're at on this process. So we are starting with megaesophagus and we've, again, been about two years into that project. And then uh, aortic rupture, we've already been collecting samples for that as well. Gastric rupture, we actually added in uh, last year. Um, just a couple of cases came to our awareness and um, things just sort of rolled in the right way where we said, hey, we, we really can't wait to start collecting samples for this disorder. We really need to go ahead and do it now. So we've uh, already started working on that as well. So I'm going to talk to you today about what megaesophagus is, just in case some of you aren't aware. And then uh, I'll talk to you about the research we've done on that so far. And then I'll also discuss with you aortic rupture, what it is, and how we're going to approach that, and then gastric rupture as well. So you get a little overview of these things. It's a lot of content, so I'm going to move through it rather quickly. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, some of this stuff is just too detailed for us to spend a lot of time on. So megaesophagus is a chronic dilation uh, of the esophagus. Uh, so typically in a horse, you see it happen right here, which is the thoracic inlet. That's usually where it starts, and then it often extends down towards the end of the esophagus, closer to the stomach. But it can also happen in the cervical region, which is everything here. So this is the horse's collarbone, if you will. So if you press on your own collarbone and sort of feel that there, Everything below that would be thoracic, and then everything above it would be cervical. So the reason we think it happens in that place most often is probably because of gravity. You can see as the food bolus is moving down into the esophagus, it doesn't really have the aid of gravity to work there. So naturally, the muscles are contracting a little bit harder to move food along. Inside the esophagus, you can see there's muscles on the outside. That's that pink on the outside. The gray material on the inside between those outer and inner mus muscle layers, that's your connective tissue. And that's where we think the problem is based off of all the tissue samples that we've taken. So it can infect the entire esophagus, which is sort of a misnomer sometimes that veterinarians have. They'll think we'll only see it at the thoracic inlet, but it actually can infect the entire esophagus. We have some horses in our study that are affected that way. That's not the typical presentation, but as the disease advances, it can get to the point where the entire esophagus, esophagus is basically hypomotile, meaning that it's not contracting correctly. There are a lot of complications that can happen with this disease. The most common ones we see are going to be uh, aspiration pneumonia. That's when the horse has an obstruction and they aspirate material into the lungs and they get an infection there in the lungs. Esophageal strictures are also very common in more advanced cases. And that's because that tissue inside the esophagus is very delicate. So every time there's an obstruction, it can create inflammation and sometimes scar tissue can happen there from fibrosis. So the esophagus uh, becomes restricted in that area. So that adds a very difficult complication to the horse that's already having difficulty. A so uh, diagnostics that we do typically is gonna be um, a scope where we look inside the esophagus with a camera. And then there's another more in-depth <laughs> diagnostic you can do called a barium swallow study. And that's when contrast material is uh, given to the horse. They swallow it and they shoot a series of radiographic films where you can see how long it takes for liquid to move through the esophagus. The prognosis for these horses is guarded. Most of that's gonna be based on how soon they're diagnosed and how well they're managed by their owners as far as their diet. Those things have a, a very great consequence on how well they'll do long-term. You're gonna look at this slide and think it's really overwhelming, but I want you to see it because most people think the sign of megaesophagus is choke. 
but in all reality, there are many, many signs and symptoms, behaviors that these horses do during, before, or after eating. So you could look at this list and say, well, my horse does, I've seen my horse do several of those things, but does it happen frequently? Does it happen around mealtime? Are you seeing it over and over again? If you see a horse with megasophagus and you get to know them really well, their behavior becomes repetitive patterns. So that's what we see owners really pick up on. And again, the sooner you can recognize that this is happening in your horse, the sooner you can get it in for a diagnostic exam, the sooner you're gonna catch the disease. This is a, a scope that you'll see up there on the top. That's a, actually a weanling, and he just had um, minor esophageal dysfunction. You can see the difference between healthy and unhealthy. And then a barium swallow study, as you can see there down below, it gives you a really good idea of where exactly the horse has the dilated area and then how long it takes for it to move through that area. Um, this one here on the end is 10 minutes after the horse is eaten. That material is still pooled in the esophagus, which is, is pretty normal for these horses. So you can see that what you would feed them is gonna have a great impact on how often they're gonna have these obstructions. And again, we find at least where we are located at in North America, especially if you're in an area where you might have a more rural vet that doesn't see Frisian horses more often or doesn't have experience with megasophagus, they might have a real difficult time giving you an accurate diagnosis with a scope, but a barium swallow study is much more obvious. So we've seen cases where vets have missed esophageal dysfunction on a scope, but then they did a follow-up barium swallow test and they were able to diagnose megasophagus and then also complications like strictures. So kind of consider the gold standard of having both of these procedures done to diagnose the horse uh, with the most detailed information. What we feed these horses again has a great bearing on how, how well they'll do. So these are examples here. A lot of the times a veterinarian may give you uh, some advice that may be contrary to what we're suggesting here. Should always work your, with your veterinarian to craft a plan. But this is what we've found works by talking to uh, a quite, a, quite a few number of owners and what we do with the megasophagus horses that we manage ourselves at the Fenway Foundation. So now what everybody has come to here today is where we're at on this thing. So when we started with the research, we had some assumptions. The first one was that this was one gene and it was recessive. Um, and the foals seem to be the most common presentation um, from the previous research studies. We do have a big, large uh, gap in age, so that is very interesting from a research uh, standpoint. You know, we have these foals that will typically present at uh, weaning age sometimes all the way up to two if they've been diagnosed later, but then there's kind of this large, strange gap where we most often don't see it again until they're in their teenage years. And so that's always been a really interesting question for us of why that is. Um, there was some indication in some other studies that maybe there was some sort of link between X chromosome, like are males uh, more frequently affected than females, but we didn't have any evidence of that from previous studies going into this. We also knew that there was a chance that there could be a possible incomplete penetrance, and that's just because of what I said earlier, that we have this large age gap. When you have incomplete penetrance, you can have affected horses that maybe have two copies of that mutated gene around in your breeding population that have no obvious signs or symptoms. And that may sound like a good thing that they have no obvious signs or symptoms, but in all reality, they're still passing on those genes unknown. Uh, it's, it's a lot more difficult to manage than something like hydrocephalus and dwarfism that's very obvious right from the start. Um, likely involves collagen. We knew that because looking at the previous research studies when they had necropsied the horse and looked at the tissue under the microscope, they could see that there was an irregular collagen pattern in the connective tissue. And again, that's why we think there's a possible link going into this that connective tissue is involved. High occurrence in the population is based on our pedigree research. So potentially it could be up to high as 65% based on our research of the cases that have been collected uh, somewhere around 200 cases that were looked at. So there was a previous study that was done on megasophagus, um, and it was a genome-wide association study, and it was unsuccessful. And the main point that the KFPS pointed out to us was that they had foals in the study, they had horses in their 20s in the study, they had males, they had females, and anytime you're looking at genetics, it helps to narrow your phenotype, and that is the characteristics of the horses. So 
If we knew that the, most of the horses were congenital presentation, we decided to approach the study by just looking at foals in this case that were affected. So we didn't have any good candidate genes. There are genes out there that are involved in certain things, and sometimes if you identify a gene going into research, you can look at that exact gene or in that area, and that can help you shorten your study time, but we didn't have that in this case. So what we actually decided to go with is a mapping and family study. This has been done uh, in dogs and other breeds of horses, but you basically take an affected horse and their closest related family members, so parents, brothers, and sisters, and you compare different family groups together. So the DNA of those animals is going to be more similar than just a wide population, so it really helps you kind of narrow down what you're looking at. So our mapping and family study, um, it took about 18 months to collect all the DNA from these horses, and that was something I think maybe we didn't anticipate was going to take as long as it did. So I'll, that's one reason why we're already collecting samples for aortic rupture and gastric rupture. Um, but it's based on nine different foals that are affected and then all of their extended family members. Interestingly for us, now this just could be unique to the cases that we had, but all of our foals that were affected were male. So we've seen that pattern repeat already um, in uh, aortic rupture and gastric rupture. There's a prevalence of male cases versus female cases. Again, we know there are older female horses with megaesophagus, but in foals, for us, the study is really uh, male, male horses under the age of three. No clinical signs in the parents or siblings, and that is, again, also interesting because we have mothers of affected foals that have had as many as 10 offspring. Some of them, two of our uh, affected foals, had full siblings, so same stallion, same mare, but the sibling wasn't affected either. So it's all very interesting as we're collecting our cases and going into this. So when we sequenced all the DNA and compared it, we start with 65,000 possible variants. And as we start adding more and more foals to the study, by April of last year, we had it narrowed down to one variant. And we were super excited. We thought, oh my gosh, we found it. This is it. This has been great. It's been so easy. Only a year and a half going into this and we've got it. But the problem for us ended up being the reference genome, which Dr. Duckrow talked about how important that is. And we're using that thoroughbred reference genome. And when we looked at uh, the affected gene that we had found, there was no mutation in it. So it simply was a difference between a thoroughbred and a Frisian, which was very unfortunate for us because we pretty much had done all that work and then we had to stop at that point and we had to regroup. So we decided to realign all of our sequences against a Shire horse genome, which is probably going to be a more uh, closely related ancestor to a Frisian, and that one variant disappeared. So again, we're back at zero. So luckily for us, we had some horses that were closely related. So we had um, foals that were produced by stallions, uh, and those foals fathers were produced by an approved stallion. So of course, we had horses that were very closely related together. So we decided to isolate the most closely related horses and look at those individually, hoping that if we found what was going on in this large family group, then that would help us direct our study in the other family groups. So that's exactly what I explained here. You've got this stallion has produced this approved stallion and this approved stallion, and he himself has a foal that's affected. And as you can see here, these animals are closely related. When we did that, we did have good success. We found a large region on chromosome one that flagged two candidate genes for us. One was related to collagen stabilization, and the other is associated with connective tissue and aortic rupture in humans. So we were very excited when we found that because we thought going into this, we're dealing with collagen and connective tissue. So that was pretty exciting for us. We felt like we're on the right track now. Both of those genes are involved in a very specific, super complicated pathway called transforming growth factor beta. And what that pathway does is it regulates cell growth. So when that pathway is messed up, lots of bad things can happen in humans, disease, cancer, things like that. So something causes those uh, cell, cells to grow at an irregular rate or incorrectly. That again kind of matched sort of what we're seeing on the histology of some of those tissue samples. 
So the only unfortunate issue here was there was a huge gap in the reference data really close to where those genes were located. We couldn't see what was going on there. And that's not a Frisian thing, it's just an issue with the reference genome. So a back, back again to the reference genome causing problems in our study. So we decided to do something different, which is called long read sequencing. All of our previous work on those reference genomes was based on short read sequencing, which is kind of chunks of data that you can see. Long read sequencing allows you to see the entire genome. So think of it like a map. So like if you were looking for a specific area, it would help to have a complete map. And that's what the long read sequencing was able to give us. I do want to point out this one full over here because he was an unusual presentation. Remember I talked about thoracic and cervical? This full was a cervical presentation and all the other fulls were thoracic. So we, we had seen that in other studies that there were a certain lower number of horses that were a cervical presentation, but he was actually affected at birth and pretty severely affected. He also had an unusual issue going on with his trachea where right above that dilated area, the trachea was also collapsed. So we were really unsure if he was um, an outlier in our study or if he was a possible different variant. So we decided to keep him in for the moment and we went ahead and did our long read sequencing. So that was completed just prior to Christmas and we met with our team right before we came over here. And what we know at this moment is that we have excellent quality data. So we uh, did long read sequencing on one of the stallions and two of the affected foals and we have libraries set up for several other horses if we have to go ahead and do long read sequencing on them. But at this point we have super quality data, so super detailed and we're making good strides in that area. The original genes that were flagged were still present when we did the long read sequencing. So what we have at this moment is an eight base pair insertion that's in a functional unit of one of the candidate genes. So those functional units tell the gene how they're supposed to behave, what they're supposed to do. And again, that was a gene associated with aortic rupture and connective tissue disease in humans. And then there's a nearby SNP as well. What's good for us at this moment is that all the parents are heterozygous, so all the mothers and fathers carry one copy of that. And then the foals, all except for our unusual presentation, are homozygous. So at this point, we're asking ourselves, is this a var different variant? When we went back and looked at what could be going on in the trachea of that foal, we found that there is a human congenital disorder involved in collagen and connective tissue disease that can actually cause the trachea not to be correctly formed. So it's possible that foal has two different issues with collagen and connective tissue, one involving the esophagus and one involving the trachea. So we're doing some extra work on him right now to see what's happening there. So this leads us to kind of where we think we are at there's probably more than one gene involved in this. So that's more challenging from a genetic research standpoint. It's also more challenging to test and, and to finish out your research for that. We also, as we're collecting cases for gastric rupture and aortic rupture, we're starting to see this pattern where things that look like they're happening the same way in different organs. So we're a little, we're not concerned, but we're, we t we're telling ourselves probably get prepared for this to be a lot more complex than what we originally thought it was going to be. So what we're doing now is we're doing uh, all that review on the data that we have. Um, we're also going to be going back on the parents that we can, and we're going to be doing diagnostics on them because we're assuming that they are also not affected and that this is going to be a recessive disorder. So we want to confirm that there's no clinical signs that have been missed in the parents. So we're going to be scoping, checking out the esophagus of stallions and mares that have produced these foals. We're also looking at list of uh, genes involved in connective tissue disease in humans. We want to see if that can help us pinpoint areas that we're looking at. And then we're also going to be developing a SNP so we can uh, do a, a test to see if we're seeing this. We have a lot of data in the laboratory, a lot of uh, DNA that the lab can use to see if we can pick up this eight base pair insertion or SNP and a lot of other foals. Our goal with this group is to identify what's going on, what are the specific variants involved, and then we're gonna expand it to the other groups. I had hoped that when we were gonna be here to do this presentation that we would have been able to tell you this is exactly the one gene and here's the test for it. But the reality is that it's just gotten simply much more complicated than we imagined. So I 
I know you're probably wondering how much longer is it gonna take us, and I can't answer that question for you. I can tell you that the team feels that we are in a really good place and that we are on the right track, and so we just have to be patient and continue to work out the data. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about what connective tissue is in a little bit more detail so you can have some context. I think that will also help set up aortic rupture and gastric rupture for you as well. Um, so connective tissue is very interesting. It's actually super complex. There's a lot of stuff involved in connective tissue. There's different types of collagen as well. So it's a little overwhelming, but in the simplest term, if you think of your body as a brick wall, the mortar in between is what connective tissue is. It's all that stuff in the middle that supports and connects and binds organs, muscles, etc. Collagen plays a super important role in connective tissue. If you think of connective tissue like a house, your collagen would be like your frame for the house. Or if connective tissue was a bridge, then your steel supports. Its job is to make sure that the connective tissue expands and contracts at a similar rate. So connective tissue disease and fresions, why do we think maybe there is some? This slide is also a lot of information, but if you look at it, we have similar issues in the esophagus, the heart, the stomach, the cornea, the eyes, hydrocephalus and dwarfism also have some interesting links, and then tendons also as well. Um, so I show you this just to let you know that this is all based on previous research work that's already been done. And as you start pulling all these threads, and as you start looking at the tissue under the microscope, we're really connecting the dots here that, you know, if you imagine in your body, connective tissue is everywhere. So if there's a problem with the genes involved in collagen or connective tissue, it's not impossible that in the Frisian horse, there could be a problem in many places in the body that could be related. Again, in previous studies, they also saw sometimes a higher presentation of males, but when they looked at the genes, they couldn't find a link with the X chromosome. So we haven't proven out why that is. I can tell you that in some dogs with megasophagus, like German shepherds, there's a study out there for them, and what they found was that there's an implication uh, with estrogen. So that is also curious and sort of makes sense. If you imagine female horse is born, it's fertile, it's got a lot of estrogen, and then as it ages, that estrogen rate starts to decline, and maybe that's when we start seeing those female cases. So again, we don't know why we're seeing this possible presentation higher in males, but it's curious and we're trying to work that out. Another curious thread that we've been pulling on lately is we've had several cases uh, reported that we've confirmed that uh, in some Frisian foals there's an irregular uh, wound healing rate. So by that I mean castration sites that might take a couple months to close. No infection, nothing irregular going on, but the tissue just isn't coming back together and healing correctly. In some colic surgeries, uh, repairs that have been made, those, those are not holding in the full. It's going back in for second colic, uh, colic surgery. And then a couple cases we've had of um, hernia repairs in foals that just aren't holding. So uh, particular filly went in three times for the same repair and the veterinarians called me and said, we think there's something wrong with this tissue here. Like we're doing these repairs, it's correct, but it's just not holding together. So the veterinarians are sort of seeing this stuff but these cases are probably widely dispersed and you know, we're not all bringing them together in one area to collect all this data, so we might be missing something there. But again, that could be easily related to connective tissue and wound healing. That's seen in human diseases involved in connective tissue as well. So connective tissue diseases in humans are interesting to look at for a comparison. So there's two that we've looked at that have fairly close ties to what we might possibly be seeing. So Ehlers-Danlos <laughs> syndrome, it's super complex and it can give you an idea of how challenging this could potentially be. So in that particular syndrome, there's 13 different types um, of that syndrome. So it can present in different parts of the body in different ways. And there's also 19 different genetic variants involved in that disease. So you can just imagine how complicated that is and how long it takes research-wise to prove all that out. But I've highlighted things in some of these, and I haven't, I haven't listed all the symptoms of these diseases, but I'm just, li I'm just highlighting some things in red for you here that are similar to what we're seeing in Frisian horses in some areas. Louise Dietz syndrome is also uh, interesting. The 
one of the genes involved in this syndrome is a candidate gene that was identified in our isolated family group. So, and then there's a long list of other human connective tissue diseases. These are separate from autoimmune related human connective tissue diseases that you might be more familiar with like lupus and some other diseases. But so these ones on the left are ones that are specifically inherited. There are equine connective tissue disease that we know about. There's been some characterization of an Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in horses already. And that specifically, in that study, they related it to recurrent skin wounds and elastic skin. In a lot of these, you'll see problems with the skin that have been identified. And that's probably because it's very obvious to see when there's a problem with the skin. What we're seeing happen in the Frisian horse is happening on the inside, so it's a lot more difficult and it's taken a lot more time to recognize. All right, moving on to gastric rupture. Gastric rupture has become sort of my favorite uh, interesting subject lately. And it's interesting because I think we've all heard of gastric rupture in Frisian horses, most likely, but a lot of us don't know why it happens. And gastroparesis is, is why it happens. So gastroparesis, gastro meaning stomach, paresis meaning paralysis. It's exactly what it means. It's the primary mechanical failure of the stomach muscles. The muscles have to contract in order to titrate food down to a level that it can leave the stomach through the exit. The exit of the stomach is called the pylorus. So it's located, it's this whole area here, the pyloric sphincter is right there and that's the opening that opens and closes, expands and contracts to let food out the stomach. The, uh, the greater curvature of the stomach, this area here, this is, would be the area that we most likely would see a gastric rupture in. That's probably because that's the area where the highest amount of uh, volume of food is going to sit in that area. And then the cardia is also interesting as well, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. I just want to point out the anatomy to you for a second. So if you go to your veterinarian and you have a fasted gastroscopy and you go in there and look at the stomach and it's, the food is still in there, most likely a veterinarian is going to tell you that's delayed gastric emptying. And it is. The, the gastric emptying is delayed but a lot of things can cause that. What we're seeing happen in Frisian horses is different, and I'll talk about that in a second. We do suspect there's a genetic inheritance for this. Obviously, we've looked at several cases, and we've seen the clear inheritance and pedigrees from father to son to son to son, and we think it's probably widely un underdiagnosed, and the reason for that is, uh, I'll talk to you about in a minute, but it's that part is very interesting for us as well. As we become more aware of this and started scoping horses, we're seeing the occurrence at a, a rate that we were not really prepared for. I'll tell you that we're collecting cases for this faster than we collected for megasophagus. The way it's managed uh, is done by food trials and uh, followed by a faster, fasted gastroscopy. So by that meaning you decide, pick out one thing you think is probably going to be safe for this horse, you feed it for a week or two, and then you go back in on a fasted stomach and you look at the stomach to see if the food has cleared. If it's cleared, then you can assume that this is probably safe for the horse to eat. If the stomach is still full, then you can say this is something we need to eliminate from the diet. So the way we manage these horses is mostly through diet management. Um, and then there are a lot of secondary complications. Gastric ulcers are very common in these horses, primarily glandular ulcers. So they're, they're ulcers that are gonna be located in the lower part of the stomach. And then gastric impaction can happen if we don't address the symptoms early enough. And if that continues, then it can result in a gastric rupture. The prognosis for this, these horses is gonna be very similar to our megasophagus horses. The sooner these horses are diagnosed, uh, the better chance they have once they get on diet management for a long-term prognosis. Symptoms of gastroparesis are, are long, again, just like megasophagus, but it looks very similar to gastric ulcers, and that's why we think this is widely undiagnosed. A lot of the times, at least where we live, if people suspect their horse have, has ulcers, they're gonna give it Gastrogard or a Meprazole, which is a proton pump inhibitor which stops the stomach from producing uh, gastric acid and that gives the stomach a chance to heal. Uh, it's a little more expensive. It, the medication itself is expensive, but a scope is, and where, at least where we live, runs around three or $400. So a lot of people think, well, I'm pretty sure my horse has gastric ulcers so I can avoid that extra charge for a scope. 
But unfortunately, at least in horses we've seen that had clear signs of gastric ulcers, when we take them in for a scope, what we find is the stomach isn't empty after they've been fasted for 12 or 24 hours. So a lot of the signs and symptoms you can see there are very similar to gastric ulcers. So our recommendation to you is that if you suspect your Frisian horse may have gastric ulcers, don't treat it, talk to your veterinarian and set up an appointment to have a gastroscopy performed. That's always positive to do anyway, because you can see if where the ulcers are located, if they're in the upper or lower part of the stomach, and then you can have a really good plan on how to treat them. You should also follow up after you do the medication and treatment to make sure that the ulcers are gone. But if you go in there and you have that faster gastroscopy, then you can see that your horse has delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis, then you know you have to make some pretty significant life changes for that horse. The way we manage these diets is a little different than megasophagus horses. I'll tell you, these horses are more difficult to manage. In megasophagus, you can see very easily if there's a problem in the esophagus, if the horse is having a choke, it's an outward sign and symptom. A lot of times you can see the horse is having trouble. But if a horse has a gastric impaction that's coming on, sometimes you really can't see that until things are quite progressed. So you have to be a little bit more careful with this diet. And again, only feed these items after you've done that uh, food trial, followed by a scope. So primary gastric impaction is what can happen if we don't manage this condition well. It's caused when food builds up in the stomach and can't get out simply. Um, it can be difficult to resolve if it's gone on for quite a long time, but there are a lot of ways that veterinarians know to treat with medication and treat the horse. So if you get it in there soon enough, uh, you should be in pretty good shape. There are a lot of things that can cause symptoms similar to gastroparesis that you need to rule out. Sometimes horses don't ingest enough water so they could have a lot of dry stomach contents that don't have the ability to titrate to leave the stomach correctly. Sometimes horses eat food too fast and they might eat something like beet pulp or certain, certain food items that swell that can cause similar issues. Uh, and then it shouldn't be confused with secondary impaction from uh, colic. So if the uh, small intestines are obstructed, um, then sometimes the food in the stomach can't get out. There's nowhere for it to go, so that can cause it to back up. So as you can see here, this is a healthy e exit to the stomach. That's that sphincter that expands and contracts constantly in order to move food out of the stomach. And then sometimes just simpler, simple glandular ulcers can block the exit of that. And this horse here, uh, food material was backed up from the stomach all the way into the esophagus, which is pretty challenging to do in a horse the way that the, the lower esophageal sphincter works. What happens when we don't resolve an impaction quickly enough is we can have a gastric rupture. And this is a very unfortunate incident when it happens. It's almost always fatal. You would have to have your horse already at the veterinarian at the time you identify it in order to resolve it uh, with uh, surgical means. I do know of one case that that has happened, um, but again, it's rare. The signs of this are gonna look very similar to a pretty violent colic. So the horse is gonna be really unbearably, uh, unbearably uncomfortable. The medications that we would normally give a horse to resolve colic pain are probably not gonna be effective in this type of horse. Um, and they typically, these cases typically advance rapidly. So in the cases that we've collected with gastric rupture, this area here, the entire thing can rupture, unfortunately. So that's immediately uh, pretty quickly fatal to the horse. So we wanna remind everybody as we're thinking about these things, how incredibly stoic Frisian horses can be. It's part of their good nature and their character, but unfortunately, um, it's kind of their Achilles heel when it comes to these type of issues. So. Don't ignore the signs and symptoms of your horse being a little bit off. Um, just know that when you're dealing with any type of pain that looks like a colic pain, our recommendation to you is that you treat it as an emergency until your veterinarian tells you it's not. So that will hopefully help you avoid this uh, unfortunate instance of gastric rupture. Now moving quickly into aortic rupture and our other future research project. Say aortic rupture uh, is very interesting in Frisian horses because of the location that it occurs. So, um, you know, the aortic arch is located here, so the aortic root is down here. In most breeds of horses, and even in other species, human beings also included, most of these ruptures are gonna happen at the aortic root. 
For some reason in frisians, they're happening in the aor aortic arch more often than not. Uh, there is an area in the aortic arch that's very interesting, and that's called the ductus arteriosus. This is an area that is a, a part of the fetal circulatory system. So it's something the foal needs in order to get oxygen through the blood because the lungs aren't pumping while it's in his mother. Um, and the way that this, this area closes, so this is, this is a close-up of what it would look like. It's, a, it's a basically a shunt-like structure. So it's a very interesting pathway that it's involved in the closure of this once the foal is born. So at the 24 to 48 hour mark, the body already knows before the mare goes into labor, something is happening, it starts sending signals. Once the foal is born and the lungs start to function, uh, interesting things happen. And this is the muscle cells on the outside, the smooth muscle that's on the outside of that duct. So signals tell the body that the smooth muscle cells need to migrate out of that area into the connective tissue and then they come into this area this empty space and they fill it up the way that the smooth muscle cells move through the connective tissue is they basically hitch a ride on uh, collagen coated structures so if our collagen isn't correctly formed perhaps in that area it's possible that maybe there's some sort of weakness here as that duct closes, and that perhaps is a reason why we see aortic rupture happen in this place more than others. We don't know the answer to that. That's just a theory. We're very curious of why the location is uh, the most prevalent for aortic rupture in Frisians. There's several different ways that aortic rupture can happen. You know, in your mind, you probably think, well, if the aorta ruptures, that's, it's probably very quickly happens and that's it, but it actually can happen in different ways and it can happen much more slowly than you might imagine. Um, we know by looking at previous research studies, when they looked at the tissue of the aorta of these horses that have been involved in aortic rupture, the collagen and collagen crosslinks were incorrectly, uh, they were incorrectly organized in that area. So again, that leads us to believe that this is related to collagen and connective tissue. Diagnostics for these horses, um, it can be a little tricky, but uh, echocardiogram is the most common. There's also a really fantastic uh, procedure that's been developed by looking, um, by going through the esophagus, you can actually ultrasound and have a better view of the heart. A lot of veterinarians probably aren't trained in that te or technique or may not know it, but an echocardiogram is something that, uh, there's a lot of diagnostics that they can do to look at the heart. Unfortunately for this disease, it's always fatal. Um, there's really nothing that we can do to prevent it once the uh, events are set in motion in the heart. Immediate aortic rupture happens when the tear in the aorta is large enough that blood leaves the heart and it also leaves the pericardial sac. So there's a sac that goes around the heart, it's like a membrane. So if blood gets out of both of those areas, then it's gonna enter the thoracic cavity it's very quick. So if you imagine a fire hose that has high pressure water in it, that's an easy way to uh, think of this. Imagine it as far as the, the uh, physical action that takes place. There's not a lot that we can do to prevent that. This often happens after horses have exercised or been used for breeding. So anything where there's high exertion, um, sometimes wherever the weakness is there in the heart, that high intensity, the heart pumping faster can bring on this event. A lot of times these horses will simply be found in the pasture, no signs of trauma, found in the stall, no signs of trauma, no real explanation for what happened. So that's the reason why a necropsy is very important in these cases to identify what exactly took place. Another way that this can happen is subacute, and that happens in days or weeks. So uh, you can imagine that if there was a tear in the aorta that wasn't quite as large as what I just described, the blood leaves the aorta, but it actually is contained by that pericardial sac. So in that case, it puts a large amount of pressure on the heart. The heart starts pumping harder in order to get enough uh, blood-rich oxygen to the rest of the body. Um, eventually, this horse will lead to a cardiac uh, failure event. There's only so much that the pericardial, pericardial sac can do to hold all that volume. Um, so it really depends on how large the initial tear is. So this could take days or weeks to come to a full conclusion for this horse. So in these cases, there will be signs and symptoms that owners can pick up on. 
Edema is uh, very common, so underneath the chest and underneath the stomach, um, these horses sometimes are more recumbent, meaning they lie down more often than would be normal. Um, it, a lot of times it will look like a colic too as well. So a lot of times we would get a call from an owner saying, I think my horse is colicking, I'm taking it in, and then necropsy uh, turns out to show it's an a, uh, aortic rupture. So again, this is just pointing out to the fact that how stoic our horses can be, so it's really important that we don't ignore signs or symptoms. Bounding pulse rate is at rest is another one, um, and I'll show you a picture of where you would look for that here. So along the horse's neck here, you might see a bounding, really evident pulse there. Chronic aortic rupture, that's gonna take weeks, potentially months to come to a full conclusion. In this case, the tear is likely smaller, and an interesting thing happens when the surrounding tissue kind of is able to hold the, the blood that's leaking from the aorta. So it acts almost as a compression bandage in that site. It can only hold the volume for so long. Um, these cases uh, don't progress as rapidly, but again, over a period of weeks or months, the blood uh, can expand and it can create other, it's gonna move to wherever it can go in the tissue in order to be contained. And then when that, uh, that false area that's holding it up um, becomes too great, then it will fail. And again, this will progress to a cardiac failure. You'll see a lot of similar signs and symptoms that we just mentioned. Here you can see some of the edema, a uh, bounding pulse again, really uh, one of the most common things we'd see. Um, also swollen joints, intermittent lameness, those sort of things, uh, continuous high pulse, um, depression, laying down more than often. So that's a good overview of um, chronic aortic rupture. We unfortunately, as we were getting on the plane, getting ready to come here, had an owner that had a very similar situation. She called and told us that she had a horse with edema, high pulse rate. We recommended that she get the horse in to be seen. Uh, they weren't able to confirm that the, there was an impending aortic rupture, but there were lots of other signs that something was not right at all in the heart. So they ended up euthanizing that horse. And um, unfortunately, this this happens, um, but again, if you can recognize the signs and symptoms, it's important because the horse is really a danger to themselves. They could fall and get hurt, or if somebody's handling them as well or riding them, you could imagine uh, there could be an accident with that. So that's a lot of information, and I know some of it probably wasn't very, uh, you probably weren't very happy to receive it. Some of it maybe is a little overwhelming, but how can you guys help us? Everybody in this room can help us, certainly. Um, one of the things we want to remind you of how important a necropsy is. So we really cannot do our research without your help in this area. Our studies depend on correct and accurate data. So we can get some of that from vet reports, especially from horses that have megasophagus or gastroparesis. But if your horse has passed away, I promise you we can learn something from that event. So it's very important to us. Um, we ask you to think about it now when your horse is healthy. I can tell you from being in that situation myself, uh, you know, whether or not you're going to do a necropsy is not, not really the most important thing to be thinking about. So if you already know that's something you want to do to contribute or at least to have more information about your horse's death, uh, we encourage you to think about that now. Think about how you're going to do it as well because sometimes there are logistics involved in that that are very practical but aren't something that you would think about. Um, if your horse is sick and you don't really know the reason, we would encourage you to have your veterinarian draw a blood sample and just put it in the fridge. We've rescued know, maybe three or four blood samples in the last couple months from refrigerators uh, that veterinarians took and then ended up having a case that could be included in our study. Um, without that blood DNA, it can be challenging for us to get a sample that we can use for DNA extraction. So whole blood is the best uh, for our studies. Um, and then if you have an unexplained death where you're not really sure what happened, perhaps one of those situations where you go out and you see your horse has passed away in the pasture, advise your veterinarian about these issues, particularly gastric rupture or aortic rupture, and let them know as they're doing the necropsy, they can be more careful to look for those areas. And then if you didn't know it before, now you know that we do have a necropsy assistance program. So we provide reimbursement for owners for necropsies.
up to $400 US for your necropsy and hist histology report. So we would encourage you to take advantage of that. And then as well, if you happen to be using a teaching hospital, a lot of times they will not charge you for a necropsy because it's something educational for the students to learn as they're doing that uh, procedure. So again, be part of the solution. You're already doing that by being here today and listening to this discussion. Know the signs and symptoms, because if you know the signs and symptoms, you can see them in your horse, or you may have a friend with those signs and symptoms, and you can let them know, hey, maybe this is potentially, this could be gastroparesis, so uh, maybe just call your veterinarian and have a scope instead of just treating with uh, ulcer medication. Uh, we would again welcome a copy of your horse's uh, vet report or necropsy report. Um, it doesn't matter if it's five years old or was from last week. We would be glad to have it either way. And then you can help us recruit horses for our study. So we're done collecting samples for megasophagus. We have all the data that we need to work on that piece, but we really need studies for gastric rupture, and we're quite desperate for studies for aortic rupture because they happen at a lesser frequency. So all we really need from someone for that uh, participation in our study is a copy of the vet report or necropsy that confirms the diagnosis. We also need, of course, a DNA sample. So for that, we can use blood or semen. And then in some cases, depending on where you're located, it's possible for us to take a tissue sample and use that for DNA extraction. And then there's an owner consent form that you have to sign, that's it. And we can collect samples from anywhere in the world. We've had them from all over the world. We'll work with you wherever you're at. Um, so please let anyone know that you know that may have a case um, that they can help us. Here are resources and contacts. We do have a couple of Facebook support groups that are set up for megasophagus gastric rupture and aortic rupture. So that's where we have owner discussions about what's happening in these horses. Owners can discuss and find some community support, get more information, and then also have a quick way to contact us. We also encourage you to visit our website, uh, fanwayfoundation.com. We have a pretty large educational library set up there. Um, so all the time we're writing articles and producing educational information. Um, our job is to be here for the Frisian community. So we do get phone calls and emails day and night, seven days a week. So don't ever hesitate to call us. If you have a question or a concern, we'd be glad to help you. That's what we're here for. So this concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes.